paper of the session is, uh, oh, there are two, two more papers. Sorry, so I skipped the uh, ADEPT. Sorry, guys. Uh, so ADEPT, uh, next paper is ADEPT, a data set for evaluating prosodic transfer. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the talk will be given by Alessandra. Yes, so that's welcome. Me. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Alexandra. I'm also um, on the same team as Tian. So um, I'm going to be, pres be presenting our second paper called ADEPT, um, a data set for evaluating prosody transfer. Um, so there are three main contributions of this work. Um, the first is that we release a data set of prosodically ambiguous sentences in English. Um, and by this, we mean that there are multiple prosodic renditions of each sentence that um, you can actually hear in the recordings. Um, and we show, I'll show in the presentation and we show in the paper as well, that we can actually use these recordings to design tasks that measure perceivability of different prosodic phenomena, um, which is exciting because we can use this perceivability to actually establish a benchmark of target performance um, for English prosody transfer specifically. Um, and lastly, uh, we can also use these recorded samples and uh, as, the, as the prosody transfer reference samples in your prosody transfer model, um, and additionally perform the same perceivability tasks on TTS output um, in order to compare performance of English prosody transfer models against each other. So that was a lot of information and I will go into detail on all of these points. Um, specifically, I will talk about how prosody transfer has been evaluated in the past. Um, I'm going to attempt to give a definition of prosody um, and I'm going to show uh, how we can use the disambiguation of prosodic subcategories um, in order to set up our, uh, evaluate, our evaluation um, that we can then use to establish this benchmark. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll show how we uh, evaluated monolingual English prosody transfer models using ADEPT in the paper, and ideally how you can do this too if you're interested. Um, cool. So how has prosody transfer been evaluated in the past? Uh, we've seen many different types of subjective evaluation. A very common one is what's known as the AXY discrimination test, in which listeners rate closeness of prosody to a reference sample. Um, we've also interestingly seen um, a song melody. So uh, these researchers uh, listened to um, uh, the fact that a song melody was successfully transferred through their model and therefore they claimed that it was good prosody transfer. Uh, we've also just seen MOS tests for naturalness. Um, this copycat Amazon paper actually used trained linguists to rate um, specifically uh, different aspects of prosody. Um, and we've also just seen a simple side-by-side -side preference test, you know, which sounds better. Um, so obviously with all of these subjective evaluation systems, there's a, a big lack of consistency, which causes two major problems. Um, one, there's no standard way of comparing prosody transfer models against each other. So, you know, if one system uses trained linguists and another system just uses a simple MOS test for naturalness with native speakers, like there really is no way for us to say, oh, this model and that model can be compared in a certain way. Um, and secondly, there's no standard benchmark of performance for prosody transfer models to aim for. So with MOS, um, we know that natural speech is somewhere above 4.0, and we can hope that our TTS models achieve that level, but we don't really have an equivalent for prosody transfer. So we're hoping to solve both of these issues uh, with ADEPT. Um, so what counts as prosody? Oh boy, linguistics. Um, so. Uh, this uh, work by Shatak Hufnagel and Turk um, gives a very good description of prosody. A universally acceptable definition of prosody has been elusive. Um, and I think that definitely describes the problem because we're all trying to do all of these things with prosody, but do we even have like a clear definition of what prosody means? Um, but they further go on to say that um, higher level structures that account for acoustic changes in F0 duration, amplitude, spectral tilt, and segmental reduction um, can be a potential working definition of prosody. So this is the working definition of prosody that we use for our ADEPT work. Um, so by this definition, lots of things can be considered prosody. Um, we've already seen talks about emotion, so these are things about an inner, a speaker's inner state, such as sadness or happiness, etc. Um, there's also uh, attitude, so attitude is aimed towards something external. So if you have a feeling towards a listener, whether you're being polite or seductive, that would be an interpersonal attitude. 
Um, whereas if you have um, an attitude towards what you are saying, if you're incredulous or surprised about what you're saying, that would be a propositional attitude. Um, we also uh, found syntactic phrase boundaries, uh, which these lead to lengthening of phrase final words um, and the following pause within a sentence. So for example, if I say, when we were at the park yesterday, we saw a bird. Um, you clearly heard a pause after yesterday. Um, there's also topical emphasis. I think we're all quite familiar with this concept. So this occurs when a content word is prosodically highlighted because of its relative importance to other words in the sentence. So for example, if I say, I will not go, you know, you clearly heard me emphasize the word not. Um, and lastly, uh, specifically with English, there's also martinicity um, in which there will always be a syllable that carries the greatest prominence or lexical stress across a sentence, such as in the sentence, I went to the park. Um, hopefully you heard that the word park had slightly more prominence the, than all of the other words. So uh, what we're hoping to claim is that when uh, researchers are trying to do prosody transfer, we are trying to transfer one of these six things. Um, and of course, uh, by this definition of prosody, there are many other things that could be considered prosody as well. These include style, like is it whispered, instructional, broadcasting style, also things like identity, you know, gender can have an impact on F0, age, accent, all of these things. However, um, we believe that these categories are less likely to change between TTS utterances. Um, and so you're more likely to explicitly record for these things and mark them in the training data. So for now, we've considered them out of scope for ADEPT. Um, great, so moving on to disambiguation, um, I've given you a big load of linguistics information and why is this interesting for us? Um, so just because a class has known prosodic effect, that does not mean that the prosodic effect is perceivable. So when we're um, generating prosodic speech for TTS, we don't actually care if we can generate happy versus sad. We care if when we generate happy versus sad, the listener can actually hear the difference. Um, so how do we actually demonstrate that that difference is perceivable? Well, we can generate, a, we can create a disambiguation task in which um, listeners are presented with a sentence with two examples of the same sentence with the same text that um, only differ in prosody. So I'll play two samples for you here. Tian went to the office yesterday. Tian went to the office yesterday. So hopefully you heard the sentence Tian went to the office yesterday, obviously referring to my colleague Tian, um, where in the first sentence, the word Tian was emphasized and uh, in the second sentence, the word yesterday was emphasized. So as naive listeners, you can hear that difference. Um, so we actually used um, this idea of um, prosodically ambiguous sentences uh, to um, aim towards creating an evaluation system. So for each of the six prosodic classes that I identified on the previous slide, we had to identify suitable subcategories. So um, as we saw in one of the earlier talks, um, there are uh, several known emotions that can be heard. Um, this is all actually from previous research. This was not our own research, but previous research has shown, for example, that listeners can hear the difference between happy, sad, disgust, fear, and anger. Sorry, there should be a comma after fear. That is my bad. Um, so we actually did this with all six of the prosody classes. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll show next. Um, after we were able to identify all the subcategories for all these different classes, we had to write sentences um, that allowed for that prosodic ambiguity. And then I'll show you next how we use those sentences for an evaluation. Um, so the goal of our evaluation is um, twofold. One, we want to identify which aspects of prosody um, were perceived by listeners. And secondly, we really want to show how well those aspects were perceived. Um, so uh, in setting up our evaluation questions, um, we had several considerations. One, um, should the questions have a single audio stimulus or should there be multiple stimuli? Um, for example, a, sim a single stimulus question would look like this. So a listener is presented with which word is most strongly emphasized in the sample? And they play the sample. Tian went to the office yesterday. And hopefully they hear that the word office is the most strongly emphasized of the three choices. Whereas with um, a multiple stimulus design, thank you, um, it's in fact uh, a, the opposite setup in which the choices are the audio samples themselves. So the listeners asked in which sample is the word office most emphasized and they play the three samples. Tian went to the office yesterday. Tian went to the office yesterday. Tian went to the office yesterday. Um, and then at that point they would select option B, the second sample. 
Um, so our second consideration in setting up these evaluation questions was should we act at, ask a direct or indirect question? Um, so on the previous slide, what you saw were direct questions. We were directly asking about the prosodic emphasis class, but we could also think about the context in which that prosody would occur um, and instead ask uh, about the, the prosody within that context. So for example, the question might look like this. Which question is best answered by the sample? The user plays the sound file again. Tian went to the office yesterday. And hopefully, in this case, they would see that um, question B, Tian went where yesterday, is the question that is best answered by that sample. Um, so we did not try every possible design for each class. Um, and uh, we did get some flack from this from one of our interspeech uh, reviewers. But in our defense, um, there were many, many different options to try. So ultimately, what we settled on was a design that allowed listeners of the recorded samples to recognize most, um, in most cases, actually all of the subcategories of a class. Um, and we use this final. Oh, sorry. We use this final design um, for each prosody class uh, and. Uh, performed um, these evaluations on just the natural samples. Um, and we show that listeners were able to identify the correct subcategories or um, subcategories or interpretations statistically significantly above chance. Um, and if a subcategory was not uh, recognized statistically significantly above chance, it was eliminated from the final design. Um, so we actually use these results on the natural samples to establish um, this benchmark of prosody recognition, which was our first goal before. So for example, on the natural samples, we found that listeners were able to identify anger from our female speaker 95% of the time. So we would hope that a TTS prosody transfer model that is transferring um, from our female speaker samples would ideally aim for a similar recognition accuracy for anger. Um, so that's the general idea. Uh, so I think this is what we've all been waiting for. Uh, how do we actually evaluate prosody transfer models using ADAPT? Um, so it's actually quite simple. Basically, uh, we have released the samples online. I'll show um, a link at the end. But you can use these samples as your prosody transfer reference. Um, so they are not meant to be seen during training. Um, and uh, we actually did this ourselves in the paper with um, two models, uh, uh, just a standard Tachytron 2 model with a reference encoder and also the Control-P model that um, Tian just presented before me. Um, and this is just a table taken from um, the paper and it's very dense, so I'll just highlight a few things. For example, you can see here, uh, does the laser pointer work? Oh, cool. Okay, um, so uh, you can see, for example, um, that uh, the control P model was able to statistically significantly um, prompt uh, recognition accuracies for topical emphasis for all three of topical emphasis's subcategories, beginning, middle, and end of the sentence, whereas the Tachytron 2 um, with reference encoder model was only able to do it uh, with topical emphasis at the beginning, so at the middle and end, uh, uh, recognition accuracy was not statistically significant. Thank you. Um, so the idea here is that we can actually compare performance of models against each other, and furthermore, we can compare performance on specific aspects of prosody, um, which we think is really interesting. Um, so this demonstrates the second goal of our research, which was the ability to compare performance of transfer between models. Um, so why would you ever want to do this? You know, just basic <laughs> monolingual prosody transfer. Um, oops, where's my next slide? Um, well, we actually asked the same question um, because at PaperCup we do speech-to-speech -speech translation and also sometimes machine dubbing. Um, so our next research question that is actually more pressing for our work specifically is can this evaluation system be applied cross-lingually? So can we actually translate these target sentences in the evaluation system into the target language and then transfer the prosody from English into the target language and um, see similar results? So that's what the next thing that we would really like to do. Um, but potentially further down the line, we we would actually like to see if this system um, can be used to evaluate prosody in TTS in general um, and not just prosody transfer because that would be very useful for our research as well. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, if you scan this QR code, it will just bring you to this slide. Um, you'll see at the top, uh, I, create, I wrote a blog post on um, how to actually perform an ADEPT evaluation. I'm hoping if you're interested in this, you'll actually give it a try. So I tried to make it as easy as possible. Um, but the second link is also just um, a blog post about the paper overall. And the corpus itself is available on Zenodo. So um, you can find it there. And if you miss the QR code, these slides are uploaded on the platform as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
So, any question from the from the floor? Oh no! Was it that boring? <laughs> <laughs> So, what is your project generator? Uh, control P, uh, adapt, and so on. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess we like well, names. I'm impressed. <laughs> there is a question from uh, Javier. Uh, he's in, in time now. So, uh, same as uh, with the contextual uh, emphasis question for emotion and attitudes, do we really care? whether it's uh, identifiable or sad, happy, and so on, or should we really care whether the rendition is appropriate for the context, so a text plus situation, this would become uh, even more critical for cross-linguistic prosodic transfer? Yeah, that's actually a really great question. Um, I think we, we were kind of working under the assumption that um, if they can hear the prosody, then it's appropriate, but that's obviously not a valid extension to make, so there's certainly more work to be done on that front. In fact, just in this vein, um, I have a question. So, so you, you said uh, the, so there are multiple possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, for example, for emphasis, yep. you mentioned this uh, single, simple ref and multiple ref, where you say, uh, is this uh, this uh, ref, uh, this sound appropriate for uh, who, where, or when? Or you have multiple ref, uh, which is the one, uh, yeah. and so on. So did you did you compare uh, for with this system the um, the stats? Mm -hmm. So what is the most discriminant task, um, at least for yeah. emphasis? Yeah, with emphasis we did actually. Um, yeah. We like I said, we didn't do it for all of them, but for emphasis we did compare the multi stimulus versus the single stimulus design, and we found that listeners um, perf uh, were able to identify emphasis more with the. Um, uh, actually, which one was it? <laughs> it is in the paper, I promise. I'm trying to remember which one it ultimately was. Uh, with the single stimulus design. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it's somehow answering to Javier. Huh? It's, it's, uh, it's more categorical than just uh, distance based or no? What do you think? Because uh, the single, uh, single ref is really. Uh, uh, you have to ca characterize whether, when, and, and so on. So it's a categorical perception. Mm. Multi-ref is just, uh, are you near from this uh, interpretation? or I don't so what, is, I what is near, in fact? So when you have multiple, multiple ref, oh. you just uh, have a question and you, you, you estimate the distance, what is the most closer to your solution mm. between the, um, the different proposals. Yeah, I, so I see what you're saying. I think with emphasis, the, the final design was actually the one um, that I showed. Uh, I can't bring up the slides now, but it was the design in which there was a single sample and um, mm -hmm. the choices were in context. So um, the available questions were like, who went to the office yesterday? Yeah, yeah. So, went to the, so the yeah, question so, is the context. Info. Yeah, in that yeah. sense, I think the context might, is that? Does that answer your question? I think that pr that provides what you're looking for because it is like which is closest yeah. in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? No, no, no. The, no. Uh, <laughs> for me, the, the single ref is, uh, as you said, you provide uh, the, the context as mm -hmm. a question, mm -hmm. and the other, it's uh, what is the closest one to the to my problem. Oh, you're saying that is yeah. what should be directly yeah. asked to the listeners. I don't know. Oh, potentially, yeah. I think um, one thing that we're hoping as well is that just because the data set is available, if you want to try your own evaluation designs, okay. certainly sure. do. Um, yeah, because there's so many possibilities with, with this type of data. Also, just the text is available. You don't have to use our samples. So the, the, the texts that are prosodically ambiguous are available as well. So we have still one minute left. Any, whatever you have in mind. So don't mind, there. Yeah. Um, so besides the uh, emphasis um, problem, you also had different emotions in there? Yes. Um, but you said the text itself was uh, ambiguous, so yes. it's not necessarily. Do you think it makes a difference whether you use text that actually is focused on the particular emotions that you would want to synthesize? Um, yeah, I would say so, um, which is why we specifically chose ones that were ambiguous for this task. Um, because we really want to decouple the the perception of, of the audio of the emotion itself from any additional context that uh, could provide that. But I think certainly if you are trying to um, like synthesize an emotive, t uh, like just 
emotive TTS in general, having text that like implies that emotion is very helpful. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you.